Let us pray. Take these ancient words, O God, and use them to speak to us, that we might know your will and follow you faithfully. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our reading from Exodus chapter 8 continues. We are in the middle of some of the plagues in Egypt. This is, let us listen uh, together now for the word of God to us. Then the Lord said to Moses, Rise early in the morning and present yourself before Pharaoh as he goes out to the water and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go so that they may serve me because if you will not let my people go, I will send swarms of flies on you your officials and your people, and into your houses. The houses of the Egyptians shall be filled with swarms of flies, as will the land where they live. But on that day I will set apart the land of Goshen, where my people live, so that no swarms of flies shall be there, that you may know that I, the Lord, am in this land. Thus I will make a distinction between my people and your people. This sign shall appear tomorrow. The Lord did so, and great swarms of flies came into the house of Pharaoh and into his officials' houses. In all of Egypt, the land was ruined because of the flies. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Go, sacrifice to your God within the land. But Moses said it would not be right to do so, for the sacrifices that we offer to the Lord our God are offensive to the Egyptians. If we offer inside of the Egyptians sacrifices that are offensive to them, will they not stone us? We must go a three days journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he commands us. So Pharaoh said, I will let you go to sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, provided you do not go very far away. Pray for me. Then Moses said, As soon as I leave you, I will pray to the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart tomorrow from Pharaoh. From his officials and from his people. Only do not let Pharaoh again deal falsely by not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. So Moses went out from Pharaoh and prayed to the Lord, and the Lord did as Moses asked. He removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his officials, and from his people. Not one remained. But Pharaoh hardened his heart, this time also, and would not let the people go. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I think I've shared with you before some of my experience in college of witnessing traveling campus preachers come and visit. I went to the University of Florida. Those of you who are familiar with UF's campus know that near the center of campus there's a large plaza, Turlington Plaza, that is a gathering place for students between classes. It's also the place to go. If you're a campus preacher and you want to gather a crowd, some of these preachers were nutty, as you would expect, uh, but some of them were quite serious. And the serious ones tended to mount a kind of scientific argument for the existence of God using science and logic. And these arguments were well constructed. And while the nutty preachers would draw a certain kind of crowd, an onlooker, the serious ones drew argument. People would come, atheist students in particular, would come and engage these preachers in a back and forth. Usually the preacher would focus on issues of creation and evolution. This was 20 years ago when these things were a little bit more in debate And the preacher would try to highlight some of the gaps in current scientific understanding and then try to pry those gaps open just a little bit wider and sow seeds of doubt or seeds of faith, if you will, seeds of doubt in science, hoping that the students would then consider a worldview of faith Meanwhile, the atheist students would argue back and they would question religious orthodoxy. They would fill in those supposed gaps showing that science is really capable of explaining all of these questions that the preacher is raising. The rest of us were just there watching for sport because it was so entertaining. But what I couldn't quite put my finger on at the time 
because I was so caught up in all of the particulars, the entertainment value, the arguments, the back and forth, the students that I'd recognized from the last preacher who came through. What I couldn't recognize then, but I do now, is that the atheist and the preacher have the same view of God. They both believe that God, if there is a God, can be understood with a scientific idiom, a, a, a logical, scientific mindset and worldview, that this God's power or weakness, this God's presence or absence, hangs on the ability of this God to do a better job than science of explaining the cosmos, of explaining the world around us. They have the same view of God. They just don't have the same view of science. God is necessary only to the extent that our explanations are inadequate. Preachers, they have less faith in science than the atheists, and so they have a greater need for faith in God. Meanwhile, the atheists have total faith in science and thus no need at all for faith in God. Either way, the preacher and the atheist both believe that God is fragile. God needs the preacher to prop up God with his clever arguments. And they were all men, by the way, these preachers. The atheist, meanwhile, believes that this God has already fallen down. The standoff between preacher and atheist on my college campus has some of the same flavor to me as the standoff between Moses and Pharaoh. We're coming now to that part of the story where we have a series of plagues that befall Egypt as demonstrations of the power of God, the God that is calling for Pharaoh to let the people go. It's a cycle of confrontations between Moses and Pharaoh. It begins innocently enough. Moses and Aaron go to Pharaoh. Moses takes his staff and throws it on the ground. It becomes a snake. Pretty amazing thing. But Pharaoh grabs his magicians. They throw their staffs down on the ground. They also become snakes. And then Moses' snake eats the other snakes so it looks like Moses wins the confrontation but Pharaoh isn't impressed and so on it goes the next stage is the beginning of the plagues let's just run through the plagues real quick so you can remember what they are the first one the the river Nile turns to blood in the second one a plague of frogs covers the land the third is a plague of gnats the fourth a plague of flies the fifth, a plague upon the livestock of Egypt. Then number six, boils on the skin of the Egyptians. Number seven, thunder and hail mixed with a little bit of fire. Number eight, a plague of locusts. Number nine, a thick darkness that descends on Egypt. And lastly, a plague on the firstborn of Egypt. So the passages that we heard this morning are plagues number three, and number four, the gnats and the flies. Interestingly, we don't really know that the Hebrew word that we translate as gnats means gnats. It could mean mosquitoes, but if that were the case, there would have only been three plagues. That would have been enough for Pharaoh to send the people away. <laughs> That's probably why they decided to go with gnats. The first two plagues, the blood and the river Nile and then the frogs, these plagues, after they happen, Pharaoh's magicians are able to recreate. They're able to replicate these very plagues by their own secret arts, is what the text says. Which means, because the magicians have stood up, have gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with God, and been able to recreate what God had done, there's no need to ascribe such great power to God. No need for Pharaoh to worry. No need for Pharaoh to fear. The gnats then, plague number three, are the first of the ten that Pharaoh's magicians cannot replicate. And when they can't replicate that plague, what do they say? They say, this is the finger of God. 
as long as God's works can be replicated, as long as they, like the preacher on campus, can be explained, understood, there's no need for God. Now, my whole mental image of this story from start to finish features Charlton Heston and Yul Brenner from the 1956 film, The Ten Commandments, because I watched it as a kid so many times I can't get those images out of my head. And that movie follows the plagues fairly closely in terms of their content and the response of the Pharaoh to those things. I also remember the hail in that movie was definitely ping pong balls. If you go back and watch it, (laughs) definitely ping pong balls with fire, with a little bit of fire. But in 2014, Ridley Scott uh, directed a new adaptation of this story. It's called Exodus, Gods, and Kings. And what Ridley Scott did was take the same story but kind of reimagines it for the more skeptical world that we live in today. A world, for one thing, with a little bit less biblical knowledge. But for another, a world that is more skeptical of God and God's action in the world. And what's especially interesting about this film is how it treats the plagues. When the plagues come, the magicians of Pharaoh, his advisors, they don't recreate the plagues. They just explain them. They just give an answer. A scientific, if you will, logical explanation how this gave rise to this, which of course gave rise rise to this, and this gave rise to this, and if there's an explanation, there's no need for God. And these explanations are not just for the first two plagues, but in in the Ridley Scott film, these explanations carry on much deeper into the plagues. It turns out that our ability to supply these kinds of explanations is an even more potent substitute for God than magic. And as the plagues escalate, as this contest escalates, as the magicians fail, as the modern magic of explanation fails, the real character of faith emerges. A narrow faith in a fragile God is seen for what it is. Now the campus contest is not a perfect analogy for the contest between Pharaoh and Moses because in the contest between Pharaoh and Moses there is a third character and that is the people of Israel and despite the outsized role that Moses and Pharaoh play in this saga, it is the people of Israel who are the main character of the story. While the contest rages between Moses and Pharaoh, as God ramps up the show of force and as the hardness of Pharaoh's heart deepens, chaos descends. What we see happening over the course of these ten plagues is the created order, as God intends it, is is turned upside down. It starts to come undone, maybe as a reflection of the fact that humanity with its cruel treatment of one another, has again upended God's intention for this world. And in response, God is giving us exactly what we seem to want, chaos and disorder. Except God says this, but on that day I will set apart the land of Goshen where my people live. I will make a distinction between my people And your people. While the contest rages and chaos descends, God protects Israel. It's very clear from the fourth plague forward that the people of Israel, the land of Goshen where they live, is sheltered from this onslaught. But what kind of protection is this? These people have endured generations of suffering and forced labor. Where was God's protection then? They've lost old and young. Where was God's protection then? Is all of this protection from the plagues that God is sending too little, too late? 
In our old neighborhood back in Michigan, we like to ride bikes around, and there were some small hills in our neighborhood, all of them much bigger than anything you'll find anywhere near this place. Practically mountains from Florida's standpoint, and so we'd like to go up to the top and ride down, and we weren't the only ones. One day we're riding down one of these hills. There's a small group of kids riding behind us, presumably brothers and sisters, and we get down towards the bottom, and I hear the sound of a child falling off of their bike. So quickly, I stop and I turn around so that I can make my way back up the hill to help. But no sooner do I turn around than mom is flying into the middle of the street to help this girl who had fallen off of her bike. I don't know where she came from. I don't know how she knew. She materialized. She must have been watching. She must have been listening She must have heard the cry of her child. And so she ran and she came to help. Was the fact that this child fell off of her bike a failure of the parent to protect their child? Should the parent have hovered around the bike to make sure that nothing bad befell her daughter while she was out in the neighborhood? Better yet, should she have never let her daughter ride her bike at all? Of course not. The protection of God is not the same as prevention of suffering. The protection of God is presence through our suffering. Sometimes when we suffer, we might think or even say something like, no good God would ever allow this to happen to me or this to happen to the world. No good God would allow this kind of suffering. As if our suffering somehow makes God's goodness impossible. But I think that our suffering does not negate God's goodness, does not negate God's existence. Our suffering demands God's goodness. Our suffering demands God's existence. God's presence. God makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. God punishes Egypt and God shields Israel. It looks an awful lot like a story of good guys versus bad guys. A favored nation versus an unfavored nation. God's chosen people and then everyone else. And it will take Israel a very long time. It will require the hard work of many bold prophets. It will require many military defeats, national defeats. It will require exile and then some for Israel to realize that the distinction that God is making here is not a national distinction. It will take a long time for Israel to realize that they are not entitled to God's favor. And this is a lesson that the church has had to relearn from time to time as well. The distinction that God is making is a special care, a special concern for the suffering. When that mom ran out into the street, maybe she had three children out there on bikes. She ran to the one who was suffering, not to the other ones, not because she doesn't love all of her children, but because one of her children was in need of special care, of special concern. And God has special concern for the suffering. God draws near to us when we suffer, not because we are God's favorite, but because that is who God is. It's the same God who sent Jesus, who said he would leave the 99 sheep in order to find the one that was lost, the one who said he would kill the fatted calf to welcome the prodigal home, the one who came to seek and to save the lost, the one who ate with outcasts and sinners, the one who said that it is the sick who need a physician and not those who are well. Not because God doesn't love everyone, Not because Jesus didn't come for everyone, but because God is a God who is present with those who suffer. 
Because God is a God who is present with us in our suffering. That is just who God is. It's easy for us to get distracted by the contest. And Pharaoh's own narrow view of God's power is tempting for us too. Because it's easier for us to trust in a God whose power is obvious. But look at Israel. Look at what happens at the end of this story. They cross the Red Sea on dry land. Can you imagine a more amazing wonder? And they get to the other side. And what do they do? They ask for more. For more wonders. If all God is is a wonder worker, it doesn't matter what wonders God provides for us, God will have to keep producing those wonders. They complained that they were thirsty and God made the miracle of water in the wilderness. They complained that they were hungry and God made the miracle of food for them in the wilderness. But the promised land eludes them. The final fulfillment eludes them. And if God is just a, an explanation machine who fills in all of the gaps as science advances then, advances, then God is going to have to keep advancing. It's a fragile God and a fragile faith. Now, I think the world has largely moved on from these scientific arguments of God, but now we have a tendency to turn God into a kind of marketable product that helps me in my pursuit of my true self, of my best life. And as my needs and my wants and my ambitions change, then God has to keep faith, keep, keep pace with my wants and my ambitions, or else God proves to be empty. It's a fragile God, a fragile faith. If you want to know who God is, if you want to know where God is, look to those who suffer because God has drawn near to them. Draw near to those who suffer and enter into their need and find God there. And when you suffer, when you experience loss and loneliness, and pain, when you are afraid, when you are angry, when you are worried, when you are hurt, know that God is with you. Not a fragile God who has something to prove, but a God who is always near to those in need. The unshakable, unchanging I am. Let us pray. God, may we not forget who you are, a God who is near to those who suffer. And may we not forget where you are, among the suffering. Help us to know you. Help us to see you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.